All right, we have a fun one for you today. So this was the referral that I got. One of my favorite referrals to work with, this is his mother-in-law. She's only in town for a short bit, and this is the x-ray that we got. You're saying, why is this so funky? Well, let's take a look at that cone beam. I'm gonna section highlight it up on the cone beam. I use the CareStream software. Uh, pro tip, you can use, I learned this a while ago from one of the reps, if you middle click, you can actually center the cursors on wherever that middle click is. So you will see there is, this tooth is rotated about 45 degrees. There's really deep decay on the palatal. Um, strange rotation for sure. So I knew this was going to be a fun one. I got some lengths, knew that there was really only one MB, so wasn't too worried about the complexity of that part of it. But wait until you see how we handle this one. So here's what the tooth looks like. As you can see, it's it's definitely rotated there. Ended up using a 2A clamp for this. The 14 wasn't going to be anywhere close to it. I've used butterfly clamps on molars before in cases like this where it's completely broken down. And with that rotation, you're, you're slamming into that implant if you're going to try to get it um, along where the traditional buckle and palatal would be. And you can see on the palatal, the... <clears throat> the clamp actually is going into where the decay is. So we're going to start off here. I'm trying to figure out how we're going to be able to do this the most effectively. And I elected to go for a dual access approach here. So just confirming that there still is decay. The dentist did let me know that he was getting close, that the decay was getting really deep. And so he'd elected to stop before it got too deep. So I'm going to start off with my surgical length eight because nothing else is long enough to get inside there. And I'm just going to remove anything that feels really soft. You'll see at the end how I kind of manage the decay with a trick that I like to use in cases like this and you can tell this tooth was not hurting her yet but it was about to based on that amount of blood that was from the pulp tissue that's actually not from the gingiva um, you can see it bleeding right there as well and just kind of getting that cleaned out I'm gonna go back in with my endo explorer here to make sure that all the decay is out and it's looking pretty good on the uh, occlusal aspect you can see that white spot there I thought it was potentially um, IRM, I think it was whatever the cement was on the existing crown there. You can see it flaked off pretty quickly. Um, so what I'm going to do is just do an axis here to pick up my MB and distal buckle. So kind of a truss style axis if you're familiar with that on lower molars. You can do something similar with upper molars. I like the idea of using a decay approach to access. So follow wherever the carries is, use that to kind of differentiate where your axis is going to be, and then move forward from there. So we're going to start as, off as we normally do, 8C file down to close to the estimated working length that I got off the comb beam, getting inside there, and I'm already starting to feel some pretty decent resistance in the MB route. I'm trying to see if there's anything else, maybe an MB2, if I can get to the palatal through the more palatal aspect of the access here. Not really, so we're just going to be treating this as two. Open up what I can with my 2006, kind of get as much out of there. I'm sorry that this is covered a little bit more than normal. I would like to, I thought the case was interesting enough that even though the video isn't perfect in some areas, it is worth saying the access, was, she couldn't open very far, and so the access was a little bit difficult here. You'll see the files getting stuck there, and then it does drop, and we're going to figure out why in just a second here. The pal, this is why I love using these, uh, heat treated martensitic files because you can bend them and get them around really not straight line access teeth. Um, in this case, we're about to rinse here with the Triton, which does contain bleach, so it doesn't taste very good. And I like to use ultra dense block up material. This is designed for making bleach trays. And I have used this stuff for years now. It works really nicely because you can light cure it. We'll speed this up here for you. No one really cares about the light cure process. 20 seconds and you have a good seal so that you don't have to worry about when you're rinsing of any of getting inside the mouth because I don't care how good you are with rubber dams it's going to be very difficult to get a good seal on a tooth that's rotated like this with such limited access so rinsing out here with Triton still loving that stuff it works better than the regular um bleach and EDTA combination in my hands and all of that inflammation there is from the pulp tissue itself it's not from the gingiva it's actually you'll see once we get it cleaned out that it's covered by that block out resin uh, rinsing that out here just to confirm and you can see the gingiva actually is very healthy that's the one thing about paddle tissue it is very tough thankfully so having a little bit of access uh, trouble accessing here so I'm going to go back in with my workhorse that 850 diamond just to refine the access even if I suspect that there's only one MB on the three-dimensional scan, I'm still going to go back in and trough a little bit. I have Dr. John Hatton in the back of my head yelling at me that there's always an MB2. <laughs> so it's worth going back in and just doing a small little amount of troughing. You'll 
I fast forwarded through that. It it they joined up nicely, so not really worried about it. I also had a switch. Uh, I kind of mentioned in the past that these 850s have just been having a problem with the diamond stripping off the tip. If you guys have any other recommendations for good access diamonds that are long and skinny, please drop a comment below because I'm always down to try something new. I've been using these for a while, and there's something weird about this current batch that's coming through. So going in here with that 8C, great as far as the MB, getting a little down farther. I still can't get good access and direct straight line access, and the reason why is because of that pulp stone. So try to get it in there with a spoon excavator. It's one of the endo ones that's a little bit longer. Unfortunately, it's just not coming out of there. So switch over to my next option, which is a endo explorer. So the nice part about that is you can kind of flick it a little bit more, break it into pieces here. Um, and you'll see it's kind of hanging up in the chamber where I would normally do my access. If I was doing a traditional, you know, pathways of the pulp access, popped it out, which is great. Here though, I want to conserve as much tooth structure as possible. Um, this is a, like I said, it's the mother-in-law of one of my best referrals when I'm going great friends and I want to make sure that we can buy it, save her tooth. A lot of you are going to be asking why on earth wouldn't you just do an implant here? She's already had two in this area. The uh, sinus was pretty low and I'm not going to charge her. <laughs> one of the things when treatment planning that we always have to consider is what is the cost of these sorts of things? And so of course I'm not going to charge the mother-in-law of my like one of my top referrals. So that makes it a lot easier to do that, have the consideration of, hey, if it works for five years, you, all you spent was a little bit of time here. You're up here seeing your you know grandkids anyway. So come hang out with me while they're at school. <laughs> um, going ahead and get my length here. As you can see, I like to put that curve, especially because if you look at that pre-op x-ray, there was a decent hook to that mesial buckle root um, getting down there. And I'm able to get this most of the way to where I want it. I'm happy with that. But you'll see in a second, I do have to do a little more work than I normally would for that mesial buckle. Um, only reading about 17 there, and I had estimated about 20 for the length here. So going back in for the palatal, making sure that looks good, going down to about where I can feel. And as you start to do more root canals, you'll feel where the constriction is. And generally, if it's a more open tooth like this one was, I can be within a millimeter or two of the apex and just use the apex locator to confirm, make sure everything looks good there and trying to find a stable point to measure from. So I was trying to figure out where my rotary files would be going when I'm doing the, the cleaning and shaping on that palatal root there, because it's definitely gonna be a fun one. So going in with my 1704, that Brass VT Scout, as you can see, we're a little bit short of where I need to go on that MB, and that's because of the wicked curve here. So I forget to zoom in for you guys. So this is at 10 times. Once again, sorry that the, some of this is covered more than I would like. It's just because there's the access was not good on here. However, it's an interesting enough tooth that I think it is worth sharing with everybody here. So um, this is working on the palatal. I am <laughs> trying to find a way to get the mirror so I can see what's going on here and get it into the actual palatal canal. Once again, my goal here is to be as conservative as possible. This tooth is already broken down enough. No need to create more trauma there. Nice little puff of blood, as you can see, as we got down there. Still using Triton to clean this out. Um, I, at this point, my distal buckle feels great, and the palatal also feels great. MB2, on the other hand, is pretty short. So we're gonna have to get back inside there. A couple things I like to do when you find a calcification calcified case or any issues like that. I'd like to go in with that 2006, that's what you're seeing me do right here, to open up the more coronal aspects. So if there's any impediments, anything that might be in the way, that will get rid of them. Um, for this case too, I'm gonna to be doing the squirt technique for the obturation on the two buccal canals. I end up using a cone on the palatal just because I don't think I'm gonna be able to get a good seal in that area. And what we're gonna do here is start kind of going back down that MB2, seeing if maybe my 2006 opened it up enough. Unfortunately, I'm still hitting a wall. Just it's it's not going down to where it needs to be. Um, You'll notice I don't really have to measure with my rotary files. At this point, I've used them long enough. I know the stopper is 1.5, so that's a 19.5 as far as the length, and you have those other hash marks on there. Uh, shout out to Dr. Raylan Wong at uh, UOP. I still remember when he was talking to the Endo Study Club way back in, gosh, 2010, and talked about how he doesn't even use the stoppers. He doesn't even buy them with it. You know, now I think you 
all of them come with it. But I, after working for so long, I can now see that you can pretty much tell, I can tell that it was between an 18 and a 19 very easily by just looking at it. So rinsing it out here and I'm still having issues. So first thing I'm gonna do is go back with that 8C file and see if, since I've cleaned out the top of it, if I can create a little bit more of a pathway to get down there. So going back in with the 8C on that MB and we're still hitting a wall. Unfortunately, hand filing is not, does not make for very good YouTube videos. So I'm gonna try to talk through it. You can see we are still short there of where I want to be. Once again, estimated here is about 20 as far as your length for both the buckles. Um, distal buckle was, I believe, 19.5 and still having issues here. So what we're gonna do is run through a series of files to try to open this up. I'm gonna use C plus files here for your board question that is between a C plus and a regular C file. C plus files are sharp at the tip, whereas every other file is blunted and they are a 0 0.03 taper instead of 0 0.02. So a little bit stiffer, you can put some more pressure on them. And what I like to do is work up six through either 10 C plus, or sometimes I'll go to a 15 to create a little bit more space for my rotary instrument to get inside there and do the work. So looking at that, we're still short of where we need to go, but I'm starting to feel that stick. There's when a lot of, you know, endo for as much as we value the microscope and seeing things, so much of this is tactile. And what I'm feeling here is a stick, almost like it's gummy, and that is a good sign. You get into a problem when you're feeling that you are just running into a solid wall, that's where we have a bad day. As long as you still have that nice little stick, you know you're within the canal and you can open it up. And so we're just going and hand filing. So just like they taught you back in dental school, sometimes you see rotaries are great, but you still need to know how to hand file and go back and do your basics. And so at this point, I'm slowly enlarging the canal using these hand files. And I like to get up to a, on a case like this that's pretty curvy and has a little bit of calcifications. I like to get up to a 15K file. The reason why is it gets space for that 17. One thing to remember, K files or C files, they compact debris. You have to have to rinse after these. Um, if it's your first time doing that, if you're a dental student watching this, rinse after every single time. I've done it long enough, I know that I'm not gonna create too much debris inside there. When you use rotary instruments, on the other hand, they pull debris up. That's the beautiful thing about rotary instruments. So just a reminder, K files will pack the debris down inside there. You want to go back in and rinse after every file or every few files. You can use bleach. Um, EDTA is a really effective one as well because it's a chelator and will help break down some calcification. So nice way to do that. You do have to be careful with EDTA. Overuse of it can soften the root surface as well, which can lead to ledging or perforations, which is never a good day for anybody. And then once you've got close to the length here, go back in with your rotary files and very gently kind of peck down to that length and feel for that stick. Um, at this this point we have actually got to length everything looks great so we're gonna do our final rinse here rinsed out with the triton going back in with the endo activator you can feel me struggling of how on earth am I going to get that into the palatal canal and I just gave up. <laughs> so it's it's not going in there. So rinsing out here with the rest of the Triton just to remove any debris that I created inside there. And then we're gonna get ready to fill up this case. So using my little micro suction here on my ASI cart to remove as much of the liquid as possible, as well as from that palatal tissue. Even though it was in the sinus, we didn't get much drainage. Looking at that cone beam, she really doesn't have a lot of um, mucositis or any issues inside the actual comb beam. So I still like using that air only strop coat. I know people are afraid of um, air embolisms. You keep the PSI low, you're going to be totally fine. And I keep shape small. You're not going to get a ton of air going through a 1704 shape inside here. So still using my paper points to make sure everything's dry all the way down to the apex. And once again, I really like this technique because it allows you to use very few paper points. You've already done most of the drying at this point. When you have the rinse with isopropyl alcohol, which actually I forgot to put the label in there, but that's what we used at the end. <laughs> it does do a nice job. So I'm going to take a couple quick still photos here. And as you can see, that's what our MB and distal buckle looks like. And then this is what that palatal looks like. So trying to get an angle here, you can see just how beautifully that block out resin creates almost a shape that will hold everything inside there. So at this point, we're gonna go ahead and obturate the case. Now in my head, I'm trying to figure out which technique I'm gonna use. Am I gonna be doing a squirt fill like normal? I'm gonna be using a cone. And in this case, I'm gonna use a hybrid here. I'm highly confident with the buccal canals that I can do a traditional you know, coneless technique and get inside there and have everything be straightforward. Anytime you go and use this technique, always recapitulate with a 20K file that has sealer on top of it. It's gonna remove any 
impediments that will, will not allow the gutta percha to flow, and it also helps carry that sealer down. Sealer acts almost as a lubricant for the gutta percha and makes it flow a little bit better here. I'm going to do things just as we have in all my other videos, BNL Beta Mini, soft gutta percha at 230 degrees with the 25 gauge multiple bend tip, go in with the night type plugger. I'm not sponsored by BNL. I just love their stuff and have used it for a long time. If they want to sponsor me and they're watching this video, please talk to me because I love your stuff. Also, um, if you are watching anyone from BNL, if you're watching this, please make a 3060 instead of 3570. The pluggers right now with the smaller sizes that we're going down to the 35 is just too big i need something a little bit smaller so if you have an r d department and want to talk to me let me know but as far as how we're doing this pretty straightforward i know we're not zoomed in right now mostly because i forgot that everybody likes it at 10 times <laughs> so i do apologize but filling this up making sure everything looks nice and solid here and then we're going to be moving on to the palatal tissue so looking good as far as those two uh, make sure we condense everything down nicely once again one of the reasons i love this condenser is it's that nitai and stainless steel so you can see there i'm using the stainless steel side to kind of clean it up and what is that that is a cone you guys are actually going to see me do warm vertical here <laughs> the reason why i went with warm vertical is because i was a little concerned about my length control with such a weird access um, you'll see later on on. It's like actually sped it up because it's so finicky, but trying to get that beta tip into this space is really difficult. So what I was doing here is measuring Gutta Percha was a little bit short of where I wanted to go. So just like with the square technique, you can go back in with a 20K file that's been coated in sealer, recapitulate, make sure that you are all the way down to where your working length is. And that combination of the 20K file, removing any impediments, plus the sealer is gonna do a nice job there. What you saw me do was I marked really with the locking forceps where I was. And you can see as we go down, very awkward angle trying to get this in here. So almost right there, give it right there. That's where I was. And you can see I dropped down that final extra millimeter to make sure we are looking good. I'm okay if I'm within about a half a millimeter of the working length for any time I do warm vertical. This is going to speed it up a little bit because like I said, this is hard to get into this area. I use the BNL Alpha tip at 230 degrees to remove the coronal aspect. And really, I'm doing a single cone technique here. I probably could have used... Uh, BC high flow um, that would have worked in this case, but I already had the H plus out, so I was going to go with that instead. I'm going to rinse this all out, make sure it looks good. Once again, this is more time than I would normally have to spend on this case, but because of the angulation and just what we had to deal with, definitely a challenging one. And I could have made it easier by making the hole a lot bigger, but I didn't want to cause damage to the tooth. So going in with the isopropyl alcohol, just to remove any remnants of sealer so that they won't have issues with bonding. I had talked to this dentist and he said to not worry about doing the buildup. He's an extremely talented dentist. So his he saw his mother-in-law the next day. So I'm not concerned about doing sponging cavity and calling it a day. I did do something kind of interesting here. We'll show you that a little bit. So at this point, we're going to be using the pack mac just to condense any voids inside here. Um, I, like I said, I love this instrument. It's a reverse threaded head strum that just apically compacts the gutta percha. And you'll see here that it did pull up a little bit of the material from the distal buckle, but you can kind of brush it on the way out and it will take any of the gutta percha that is stuck on there and push it back down apically. So this is another one that is technique sensitive. I hated it the first time I used this thing because I wasn't using it as it was supposed to. <laughs> and it just ripped all the gutta percha out because it's a head strum. That's what they do. Um, shout out to Finding Nemo, and yes, the big puffer fish was right. Um, if you know, you know. So making sure everything looks good here. Pal happy with the palatal, happy with the MB. The distal buckle, though, is a little bit low. I'm going to make sure that we have a nice solid platform for the dentist to build his composite against. And the distal buckle, you saw that the Pac Mac did rip out a little bit extra. So I'm going to come back in here with the beta, just fill that up so it looks nice and pretty, and we have no issues with that. Now, in this case here, getting the check film was a mess. <laughs> Her tooth is angled, she has a really shallow palate, and it's twisted. So it took multiple x-rays. None of them look great. However, between a couple of them, I was able to see that everything looked good. I'll show you in a second here the best looking one out of all of them. Um, I also cut it out, but I did take a quick check film of the palatal, making sure that my 
gutta percha cone was to length. This was such a strange case. I didn't want to leave anything to chance. Generally, if I'm at my working length, I don't worry about it. That's what we're looking at as far as our check film there. You can see the curve on the MB, hence why I had to do a little bit more work. So what I'm trying to do here is figure out how I'm going to temporize this. Normally, if it's a regular case, I have my assistant do it because it's pretty straightforward if it's just like a crown. In this case, though, I said, don't you worry, <laughs> I got this one, and then started panicking about how I was going to work on the palatal. The occlusal aspect with over the buckles is very straightforward, sponge cap, I call it a day. But at this point, I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do to seal up that palatal and make sure that it's protected. So one thing, do not use cotton pellets. They are absolutely awful. If you want your referrals to love you, use an endo sponge. We take uh, endo sponge, chop it up using a blade, sterilize them and keep small little pieces together. And then that's what we use uh, underneath the cavity. Two reasons for this. Number one, it's easier to remove. And number two, when you do remove it, it doesn't get caught on the burr and pretty much destroy it like cottonwood and make that horrible, awful sound. So I have a pet peeve against both IRM and sponges, and there it is. And you saw me just commit a cardinal sin, right? I took the rubber dam off before we put that on. Uh, when's the last time you knew of a general dentist who didn't who, who placed the core without a rubber dam. Like, it's all the time. So I'm not too concerned here, but what I am concerned about is the limited amount of tooth structure remaining there. That's where that tooth is gonna fail, right in that furcal area. You can see a little bit of the staining there. I don't wanna remove it, it's not soft. So I want to set this tooth up for success. And how I did that, is I use silver diamine fluoride. I absolutely love this stuff. It works fantastically well. And what I did is I soaked one of my little endo sponges in there you can see the blue, that's what the SDF looks like. And I'm going to be packing it in there. So over the day, because she was going to go see the dentist the next day, over the day, that silver and fluoride is going to soak into that tooth and help create a hopefully impenetrable barrier to um, caries. Go over with a cavet, smooth it out with a nice uh, glick, and then a wet cotton pellet just to make sure it's as perfect as can be. Send it off to the dentist. Talk to him the next day. She felt great, no pain whatsoever, which is fantastic. Um, and I still need to get, he said he, it was a, quite the interesting crown prep, to say the least. So we were both uh, both struggling here. I know um, his wife is a dentist as well, and uh, she was very impressed that we were able to try and save her mom's tooth here because definitely not the easiest case of all time. You'll see here, like I said, the x-rays because of her palate and just how everything was shaped not the easiest so that shows the two buckle roots that crazy curve is pretty visible here as well uh, as far as the rotation of the tooth um, and you can see she doesn't have a lot of bone for an implant in this area so if we can buy her some more time I am completely happy with that here's a very poorly angled x-ray that shows the length on the palatal and the rest of them so all in all I thought it was a cool case, not something you see every day, and I'm really happy that we are able to take care of that. As always, thank you guys for watching. Please subscribe and just like the video and comment. I'm trying to get this up. I make these for you guys. So let me know what you'd like to see next, and I will see you all next time. Thanks.